This is a Sandy Boy Productions podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to All Have Another Podcast with Lindsay Hine. I'm your host, Lindsay. Thanks so much for being here today. Hey, I hope you are all considering joining me for the Donna Marathon weekend, February 6th in Jacksonville, Florida. It starts and finishes on the beach. You don't run the race on the beach, though. So it's a fast course. It's flat and it's beautiful in Jacksonville in February. This race benefits the Donna Foundation, which helps people walking through a breast cancer diagnosis and also funds groundbreaking research. This is my going to be my fourth year at the event. I cannot wait to get there. I'm doing the half. Uh, so put it on your calendar, February 6th. It's that weekend down in Jacksonville. Uh, go to breastcancermarathon.com. Use the code Lindsay10. That's Lindsay10. And that'll get you 10% off any of their races. They have a 5K, a half marathon, a marathon, and lots of fun relay options as well. If you need a training plan, I have 14-week half marathon training plans on my website. You can find those at lindsayhine.com. All right, friends. Today's episode is episode 348. And my guest is Lanny Marchant. Lanny is a Canadian runner, and she's a 2016 Olympian. She ran in Rio in the 10,000 and the marathon. She held the Canadian record for the marathon for six years from 2013 to 2019 with a 228. And since the 2016 Olympics in Rio, she has had just a wild few years of surgeries and loss in her life and grief and so much that she has walked through. So she took some time off running and you're going to hear all about what that was like and then decided to run the New York City Marathon this past fall where she unexpectedly placed 11th and ran a 232 performing much faster of a time than she anticipated. And so we're going to talk about all those things in the race. She raised money for an addiction awareness program, which we're going to hear about in the episode as well. So this was a great episode, man. She's been through a lot and I love her analogy at the end. When I ask her what her message to the audience is, you'll have to wait and hear that. It's really good. Um, all right, friends, if you need a place to carry your phone or your keys, or your ID, or some money. When you run, you need the Koala Clip. That is what I use to carry my phone with me on the go. Just clip it to the back of my Razorback sports bra and it just stays in place and doesn't jostle around. I love it so much. I've been using the Koala Clip for years. And oh my goodness, they also have sports bras now, okay? They have sports bras and leggings. Christina, the founder, has expanded her offerings and I know how much heart and passion and hard work and great design goes behind everything that she has. So check them out. Go to koalaclip.com. This is a great gift idea. Put it on your Christmas list as well. Koalaclip.com. Use the code ANOTHER10 to save 10% off your order. All right, friends, if you are enjoying this podcast, leave us a quick rating and review. That would be so awesome. Let's try to get over 2,000 ratings and reviews on iTunes before the end of the year. I think I made that goal to get over 1,000 before the end of the year a few years back. And so I think it's time to get over that 2,000. So if you could just take a quick minute and do that, I would appreciate it so much. And if you do enjoy this episode, share it with your friends so that we can get more people tuning in to the podcast. Cool. I appreciate you being here. Enjoy my conversation with Lanny. All right. Well, today on the podcast, we have Lanny Marchant on the show. Welcome to the show, Lanny. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to have you on. I love interviewing Canadian athletes. I've interviewed (laughs) several of your fellow Canadians. So we are overdue. It is time to make this happen. Yeah, no, it'll be fun. Um, How are you feeling post New York? I know that race was you ran like surprisingly very fast and (laughs) you've overcome so much in the past year and five years really. So talk to us a little bit about how you're feeling after that 11th place 232 in New York. 
Um, I'm feeling really good. I actually recovered so quickly. Um, I was sore for about two days and did the like walk backwards down the stairs that marathoners do. But then by the third or fourth day, I was like, if I wanted to, I could go run right now. But staying true to the rule that I've been living by the past six or eight months is I don't want to. So I'm not going to. <laughs> so it was like an interesting place to be because I've never recovered that quick post-marathon. And usually you're, I'm always trying to turn over and get back into training for something else. And yeah, I, my body felt great. But I was like, you know what? I really I don't want to run right now. So I'm not going to. I did start this week doing some run walking again just to make sure, you know, once I do get back into running, there's no like little niggles left over from the race or any pains or anything like that. So I did just the last two days I've done two by 10 minutes on one minute walk. And I'll probably do that the rest of the week and see where I feel after that and build from there. Listen to that, everybody. Two by 10 minutes on one minute walk. Okay. Let's, <laughs> I feel like even the amateurs do not take their recovery seriously enough. No, I know so many amateurs all the way up to the top pros who just jump right back into training and it's sustainable. I mean, I used to. And then when the bottom falls out, it falls out ugly. And I don't want to repeat the last five years. So I'm going to be very kind to my body and just do what I need to do when I need to do it. Okay, so there's a lot to that, that you like are now to this place. Like there is so much life that has happened and so many things that have happened from running in the Olympics in 2016 and like all these surgeries and and tragedy that you've walked through. So I think that we should maybe start, let's walk back a little bit um, so we can kind of introduce your story to the listeners and then get to present day. Um, where you just finished 11th top Canadian in New York. So I know you grew up an ice skater and you had several <laughs> siblings. I can't imagine growing up as one of seven. Yeah, it was hectic <laughs> to say the least. Let's start right there then. How do you think growing up with so many siblings shaped the kind of person that you are today? Um, well, I think I'm, I would say I'm very tolerant of very – fringe personalities because I grew up with so many different personalities in one household um you just I'm very easygoing and I think it's just because you just had to learn you just had to go with the flow if you tried to be um overly controlling of, in that household it didn't it didn't yeah. work um most of my siblings are bigger than me um so I just learned my place like if, if they want that last bit of food in the fridge my brother would literally pick me up and move me <laughs> and then take the food out of the fridge um, but then in terms of sport, like we were all very athletic, you said, like we grew up figure skating my sisters and I, uh, so we, the punishment was always to run laps around the parking lot when you misbehave. We were at a very high level skating center where you weren't allowed to chew gum. You couldn't wear blue jeans, your hair had to be perfect. And I had really curly, unruly, dark hair. And all my sisters are these like perfect little blondes. And so I just black sheep right from the get go. And so like. I'd always get in trouble because my hair wouldn't be how it was supposed to be. or And then it just shows my personality type that I was like, I'm going to take your punishment and make a career out of it. So like, here we yeah. go. Um, but I always had someone to run with. And right from high school straight through to my final weeks before the Rio Olympics, my siblings were either biking or running with me for some of my easy runs. Um, my two of my sisters ran track in high school. One ran track at Detroit Mercy. So they would, if they couldn't do the whole workout with me, they would jump in and pace for a 200 or a 400, and then they'd walk across and pick me back up again. So it was a very much a family affair that got me um, to the high level of running and prepped for the Olympics. That's like so special. I mean, it's kind of crazy that anybody could keep up with you even for two or 400, <laughs> truly. Yeah. Um, no, it was really cool. Um, and now my brother's daughter, um, she runs – track with my former club so she's being coached by my same coach and uh it's just kind of cool to see it come full circle and she'll get out and she'll run with me just my easy runs and she'll go down if, if she doesn't have track practice she'll text me and ask like what kind of track workout can I go do and my brother will go do it with her so um being athletic and moving our bodies has always been a big big thing in my family okay so do you you do you live in London Ontario 
That's where I'm originally from. Um, I live in Denver now. Okay. Um, I kind of have been a gypsy my entire adult life and then somehow found myself landed in Denver. (laughs) So here I am. Like Denver, Colorado? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) I am. People make fun of me. I am not really great with my Canada geography. So I was thinking, is there a Denver in Canada? (laughs) Yeah. No. Uh, No, I'm in Colorado. I came out to Boulder at the start of 2020 for a training camp and then the world ended yeah. and I decided to stay. I have status down here with my legal career, uh-huh. so I could stay and it wasn't certain if I went back to Canada that I'd be able to get back across or when I could get back across. So um, I stayed in Boulder and then I bounced around to LA and Phoenix for a little bit and then found a spot here in Denver and I've parked myself here. Yeah, why, why Denver? I wanted to stay at altitude I'm sick of Flagstaff. Like I I trained there so much. I find it too small. And I found Boulder to be a bit small. And it could be because it was the pandemic, but I was very isolated up there. Mm. Like I moved there. I didn't really know anybody. Been about six or eight months really not interacting much with a human. I had my dog and we'd go for tons of walks that uh, I house sat last Christmas because I couldn't go home. I house sat at a condo down here in Denver. And I was like, things are just starting to open back up. And I was like, you know, it's the same altitude. It's a 30 minute drive up to Boulder. If I want to go run up there, you still drive about 20 minutes when you're in Boulder to get out to the roads that everybody runs on anyways. So I was like, you know what I do, I need to be around like a city where I can walk to the grocery store and, you know, be around people. And then if, again, if I, there's trails everywhere around here within 30 minutes. So I'm, I'm not lacking for places to run. Yeah, there's something about that, like being able if you're if you are isolated or, you know, like during the pandemic, if you are able to just like go on a walk and and just say hello to other humans, that makes you feel a little bit less alone. Yeah, like I think there's something that you have to have seven interactions per like seven different people per day to not feel lonely. And I was like, I can go weeks without seeing a human. <laughs> I was like, this this can't be good for my mental health. I've been remote since 2013, so that part didn't bother me. The shift that everybody else had about not going into an office. So I live a pretty solitary life anyways. So for me to get to the point that I was feeling a bit lonely, I was like, this has to be really bad. I don't think I knew that that fact. Seven interactions with seven different people a day. Yeah, like a total of, yeah, something along those lines. Um, But it can count just saying hi to the, like, grocery clerk. Like, just, it has to be... A different person you can't see the same person seven times you have to see a different person seven times That's so um, throughout the day yeah. yeah when we we recently moved and when we moved that was like one of my criterias I was like I like that like I'm working out in my garage and I don't have to go to a gym to do that but I need to know that like when I go walk to pick up my kids from school or something that I might see neighbors that I can just like have a quick hello to like not a long conversation but I just I felt like I just knew I needed that I needed that quick interaction with people. So, okay, we're, we're breaking, uh, we're like shattering heads right now. Like everybody <laughs> now, now knows they ca- start counting the people you interact with today, guys. Yeah. It's not easy. I like, I respect the people that live in Flagstaff and Boulder for me. Like I can do that. If it's a training camp, I can agree to go be and live in this running community as a training camp. If it's just my life, then I need to be able to say, hi, running, but you're here. My life is here. And I, that's also why I left Boulder. It was like, I can't just have Mm -hmm. my life be a perpetual training camp. All that. Um, Tell me if you think this, I've heard several runners say that Boulder is like a bougie flagstaff. Yes, it is. (laughs) (laughs) Most definitely it is. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, the best way to put it, a bougie flag staff, because it's just the money up there, the people up there, everyone's kind. It's just different, different Which vibes. is like so kind of weird because so many like sub elite runners or people that are like pursuing the dream go live there. And I'm like, how do you even afford it? Like it's so, I guess you have a bunch of roommates and, you know, you live that life, yeah. but it's just like, it's kind of insane because when you're just starting out with running and you don't have a big time sponsor, like it's hard. Yeah, it, it, it's pricey up there. I definitely had to penny pinch and pick up a couple side hustles. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Okay. Tell us about your uh, law career. I mean, you have two law degrees. 
Yeah, um, I graduated from University of Ottawa College of Law and then Michigan State College of Law as well. Um, I'm licensed in Tennessee. I work for a firm there. I started with one firm and then was fired in an email on my birthday on the way to Rotterdam to try and qualify for the 2012 Olympics. So great. that was great. And then I came back from Rotterdam homeless and jobless because I was also renting from my boss and I had to move out. Uh, but I me- I was already ghostwriting for another firm. I'd kind of already sensed that I wouldn't be staying at the firm I was at. So I was ghostwriting for the firm that I'm at now. So ghostwriting is where the part, the other lawyers' names go on it, but I write the brief and they, if it goes to court, they'll argue it and everything, but I do all the research and all the writing. So I was already doing that. And so then I was kind of like, can we just make this legitimate? Like, so are you guys just like paying me secretly? Can you just like pay me for real? <laughs> uh, so I've, I've been with them since July of 2012. And like I said, I've been remote with them since 2013, February, 2013 is when I, was going to go back to Kenya to train again. And I was like, look, this didn't work last time with the other firm. They said they were in full support of it. Mm. And then I got back and they canned me, even though I had more billable hours in Kenya than anyone else at the firm. So let's do this eyes wide open and agree that there's no overhead for me. You're not paying for an office. I'm not, you're not giving me an office space. Like I do my work. I, I email it in. I'll come to the office when you need me. But otherwise, like, I, let me just be a traveling lawyer. And that's kind of what we've done since 2013. That's so great that you can do that. That's so awesome. How has it been, like, competing at the highest level? You know, I know that it was, like, such a nightmare even getting to run in the Olympics in 2016 with the federations and, like, just all of the things, all of the boxes, and then still not knowing um, and it not happening in 2012 as well. But like, what is that like when you're, I imagine if you're, sh- you just have your running and like, that's all it is. You have no like escape. Do you feel, is that great? Like, do you love that you have the law and like a job outside of running to like focus on? Yeah. I always said I'm a better lawyer when I'm running and I'm a better runner when I'm lawyering. Mm. Um, because it gives you perspective. Like if I have a really crappy workout or crappy race, but then I'm working on a trial brief that somebody's facing life in prison, like, okay, well, perspective. Yeah, <laughs> right. That that race no longer matters. Like I need to do this job and do it well. Yeah. Um, and if I get overwhelmed and bogged down with something that I'm working on on a case, it's nice to be able to escape and go run. So like they're eerily similar in the sense that prepping for – a trial brief or an appellate brief is like running a marathon. Like it's such a long process and a long game because I'm remote. I'm obviously not in court arguing every day. I'm doing all the stuff behind the scenes and it's like prepping for a marathon. Like everyone sees you marathon day. They don't see all the work that goes into it behind the scenes. Uh, So it makes, it's kind of interesting that my brain likes that kind of law. And because I also like the long game and running. Um, why do you, why did you get two law degrees so that you could, do you have to get a separate degree in the States to be able to practice in Canada and the States? Yeah. So I did the dual program cause I didn't know where I wanted to end up. Um, I, I'd already been in like interning down in Tennessee. So I sensed that I would go there, but I wanted to make sure I covered my bases. The beauty of it was I got to pay Canadian tuition the entire time, which was a huge thing. Cause I was, I was self-funding my, my, education at that point like I was done with eligibility there's no scholarships for sport left um and out-of-state tuition so if I had just gone to Michigan State directly I think out-of-state tuition was like 60 to 80k US a year and I paid 13k Canadian a year wow so I still ended up graduating with over a hundred thousand dollars of debt but wow it would have been substantially more I wouldn't have been able to afford it I didn't like the banks were so tight because I, because of how my family is, there wasn't anybody who could co-sign for me. So like my approval for any funds that I got from the bank was like so tight and so little, so low that I was literally selling my plasma to buy groceries through law school. Like it wasn't like there was, if there was a, a luncheon, I was in there with Tupperware stealing extra food. Yeah. Like I, I was penny pinching beyond penny pinching. Um, and so that's partly why I, when I applied to law school, 
I mostly just applied to the dual programs so that I could afford it, really. And it was an extra year of school, but one extra year at 13K was still cheaper than three years at 60 to 80K. Uh, so I just did some simple math on that one. Um, I actually did plan on writing, sitting for the bar in Canada. Uh, I was supposed to do it in 2012, but that's when I got fired in an email on my birthday. And so I didn't have the funds to do it anymore. And then I had planned, so then the next four years were prepping for Rio, like building for that. And then I was signed up to write it, sit for it in the spring of 2017. But that's when I had my kidney surgery and went septic and almost died. So I kind of feel like the universe is just telling me, don't don't sit for that bar exam anytime soon. Yeah. So I've just left it alone. I'm perfectly fine to practice law in the U.S. and I'll just keep doing that. I'll stay in my lane. Thank you. Yes. Um, your kidney surgery. Do you have the same kidney condition that your dad had? Um, my dad and my mom both had bad kidneys and kidney stones. Um my dad was, was probably a side effect of his long-term drug use because my dad was an addict. Okay. Um, my mom has really bad kidney stone disease, and that's what I, I've been passing kidney stones since high school. Wow. And she, in a weird way, 10 years almost to the day from her kidney surgery that almost killed her is when I had my kidney surgery that almost killed me. So... I don't like, I like to close circles and I hope that circle stays shut yeah, now, but goodbye. yeah, the start, uh, maybe it was a summer before. Yeah, it was a few months off from each other, but so end of summer 2007, she went in for a stone removal and they, they put a hole, cut a hole in her bowel accidentally. So that she went septic. And for me, I went in for a stone removal and the stone had been in my kidney for so long um, I had been on antibiotics from November 2015 through May 2017, wow. so almost two years, because I, we just couldn't get rid of this kidney infection. And if I came off the antibiotics, I'd have a kidney infection, a UTI, and pneumonia. Like, it was just everything would just infect all over. And we couldn't kick it. And I was finally like, well, you guys keep saying this stone isn't causing any problems, but it's been in there for 10 years. Like, can we just get rid of it? take it out, like, get rid of it? And what we didn't realize was the stone had damaged the top portion of my kidney, the tissue in there. So my body had encapsulated it in a cyst. And so when they went in to remove the stone, they had to rupture the cyst. And the cyst was actually an abscess and it was filled with pus. And so that's why I couldn't get rid of the infection was infection was leaking out of the cyst all the time. And so no one, re we didn't know. And so they removed the stone, the cyst ruptures, and I go poison floods through my body oh, immediately. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I am fortunate. Like I'd flown to Kenya with that thing in my kidney. Like right. I'm fortunate that it hadn't ruptured at any other point in my life, at least this way I was in a controlled setting. Um, but yeah, it resulted in an eight day stay at the hospital and just being very, very ill. Um, I didn't realize what sepsis means until years later when people were like, there's a high like mortality rate on that and I was like oh nobody nobody told me how serious it was almost until... better you didn't know at the time <laughs> yeah probably uh and but what I really did realize was as much as I was deemed healthy when I was discharged it probably took until 2020 or even 2021 for my body to be fully back to normal like all of the antibiotics had killed my guts um mm -hmm. all of the everything like brain fog, migraines, like there were symptoms that I didn't realize were probably still tied back to that episode of sepsis. Gosh. And when you are using your body for your job and you know, it's like, you just probably felt like I can't get a break. I exactly. And I looked back, looking back, like I tried to go to worlds that summer, like nobody and I don't fault my coach or my team or anybody, but nobody really was like, you know what? It's okay. Like you can take a break. Unfortunately, it took until this 2021 for me to go, I can't do this anymore. I need a break. Because from 2017, like as well, you alluded to 2016, getting on the Olympic team was already hard. I did everything I was supposed to with all the sickness boiling up in my body, not knowing what was wrong with me. Um, getting, you know, fighting the Federation to even be able to go compete in the events that I qualified in to then 
um, that Christmas, my dad overdosed and died. And then 2017, I had my kidney surgery. My grandma dies. My aunt had died before the Olympics as well. So my dad's sister died in the start of 2016. The Olympics were a shit show. <laughs> my dad overdoses and dies. I almost die. My grandma dies. 2018, I find out I have to have potentially career-ending hip surgery. The same week as my kidney surgery from the year before. Get through that. 2019, find out I have to have endometriosis surgery the same week as my hip surgery and kidney surgery. So everyone else is prepping for these big events and watching Krista Duchenne come third in Boston and um, Natasha Woodak, you know, win a Pan Am Games medal, you know, finish fourth at Commonwealth Games, like watching all my teammates and competitors, the Olympics literally was a catalyst for them. And for me, it was just kind of like the beginning of the end. Um, so it was really hard. And I just, we kept just getting you ready for surgery and then being like, we can get you back for a fall marathon. And then I'd have a stress fracture show up on the right side, or I'd have some other thing that just because my body just wasn't able to do it anymore. Um, started 2020, I moved out here to Boulder. Um, and then my grandma, like my mom's mom dies and then the pandemic hits. And then we, I start to gain momentum I actually have an okay fall um, of 2020, which is kind of funny. Like I couldn't get any body work or anything. And I think that actually helped. I think my body was actually able to find its own homeostasis without being like poked and prodded every couple of weeks. Like I used to go to Phoenix and get work done two weeks of every month. And it just, it wasn't helping. And it wasn't like people, I do think in that industry, if you're not seeing change, then like, try a different approach but I was so just no this is what I need to do to get better um so then 2021 rolls around I set myself up here in Denver make start to make friends make friends with a guy in my building we walk our dogs together um his workout at the gym with his sister like we were just became like partners in crime like just completely platonic but really good friends like a little uh buddy and then I didn't hear from him for a couple of days. And so then I go to check on him. His sister asks if I've heard from him. I say no. And I go check on him. She meets me there. Um, I understand it was a very tense moment, but I do wish she had given me a bit of heads up on what I might find on the other side of that door. But I wasn't given a heads up. And I went in. She didn't. Um, I went in and I found him. He had uh, succumbed to an overdose um, in a very similar manner to my dad. So it was quite traumatic. Um, and I was dressed to go run. That was a really twisted thing as I was about to go do a workout on the path here. And I was just nipping over. I wrote, I wrote an article about it. Um, cause he had had the, the man flu a few weeks before, like he'd gone out with his friends. So I just assumed I was going to go knock on his door. He'd be hung over and I'd go get him some Pedialyte. Like that's what I thought was going to happen. And that is not at all what happened but I remember being there in my running clothes and just looking at them and going like this is effing bullshit like are you kidding me right now like I have worked so hard to even give myself a chance at the 2020 slash 2021 Olympics like we have pushed my body again and again and again and I pushed through all these dead people in my life people just keep dying on me and I keep pushing are you serious Zach are you this is are you, this is what the universe is going to give me now. And so I walked out of there and I was like, I don't care if I never run a step again. I need to just stop pushing. This is such crap that you can't like, there's athletes that do it. They are, their, their parent dies and they go and they win an Olympic medal. I'm not that person. And those athletes didn't, didn't necessarily have five years of dealing with complete crap before that really tr tragic event. So yeah, I just, that was the final straw for me where I was like, I had like my Nike 4% shoes on to go do a tempo. And I was just like, I don't even, ugh. I was so worried about this workout and if the, like the races in the coming weeks, cause that's when like the California and the Portland track races were all starting up were those next few weeks. I was like, I was so in my head and so nervous that even my last interaction with Zach, I was like a bit tense. And so when he didn't show up to walk our dogs that night, I was kind of relieved because I was like, I'm grumpy and I don't want to be grumpy with him. 
I'm stressed, I'm hormonal. I really don't want to do this workout tomorrow by myself. Like it was all these very selfish thoughts, but I, and I didn't want to be mean to him. So when he didn't show up that night to walk the dogs, I didn't text him and ask like, where are you at or what's going on? And then the next time I see him, he's on his floor. So it was like really awful to be like, I let running make my last interaction with the person be not what I wanted it to be. And so I just couldn't. And I called my coach a few, a uh, few days later and he agreed. He's like, we just need, you can take the next 18 months to 18 years to decide what you want to do with running. He's like, we keep trying. This was completely out of left field. You're done. He's like, you're not done forever, but you're cooked right now. <laughs> just walk away. And that's how, what I spent most of the summer doing was just walking away from all the, imp- the, the intensity of high level running. What did you go do that day after you left his apartment? Um, so we left the apartment, went downstairs, and the police were there. And at that point, his his father had come. Um, awkward c- circumstances to like meet someone's parents, yeah. obviously. Um, his sister was there. I was holding his dogs on the leash still, and you know, talked to the detectives. And then everybody left, and I just was left standing on the corner, like. The parent, the, the father and daughter left, the cops all left, they took the dog, and I just stood there. And it was kind of like in a movie when the, like a bomb goes off and you hear static. Like, that's what my head was just filled with static. And I was like, for the first time in the pandemic, I realized I don't have any family here. I'm just by myself. And it, I was so out of it. Talk about shock. I couldn't figure out how to get back into my apartment. I couldn't figure out how to, because it's three towers in our building. But you can walk through his tower to get to mine. I had to ask. I'm standing on the corner of the road. and I'm like, how do I get into the chestnut tower? And people are just looking at me like I'm crazed. Um, but I did eventually make my way up here. I got my dog, went down to the lobby in my tower. And all my stuff from Canada was getting shipped out here. And it was supposed to arrive that day. And I reserved the elevator. And Zach actually was supposed to help me unpack it all. So... I go down and I'm out of it and I look at the front desk and I like the my they had called the delivery truck had called and I look at the front desk and I was like I can't you you sort this out and they knew what like what had happened uh-huh. so they're like I'm like I I don't need the elevator today and can you can you I I don't want my things like tell them no so they they got it bumped a week <laughs> they got them they stored it for free which was nice. Um, and then I took my dog and I walked. There's a park just across the street here, like on the other side of the building across from me. And I walked my dog in the park. I didn't bring a wallet or anything. And I should have because it was the first hot day we'd had. And I walked my dog for the next three or four hours because every time I came to try to come back to the building, I just couldn't. Mm. Like it was every time I would turn to walk back up the stairwell to come here, I just, nope. And then my girlfriend. I got a hold of one of my girlfriends here and she came and picked me up. And then I just spent the weekend at her place because I just couldn't come back. And it took a long time for me to feel comfortable and safe back in this living environment. Um, I still like don't like going over to that tower and like cert- there's certain parts of the building that I just tend to avoid. Um, but yeah, that first day and that first weekend was awful because I just you're just in shock. You just don't know what to do with anything so I can't imagine I certainly wasn't running (laughs) it certainly was not running hey friends a quick break here Black Friday is starting and if you've listened to this podcast for a while now you know that I love Prevenex and their amazing nutrition supplements their multivitamins their protein powder. I've been using their products for a year and a half and love them. And I love the mission behind Prevenex so much. Maybe you're someone who's tried their products and benefited from them. I don't know. I have good news though. Prevenex is opening up its largest sale of the year for our listeners. While the full site officially kicks off on Thanksgiving, starting right now, you can use the code ANOTHER20. That's ANOTHER20 for 20% off your order. And to top it off, Prevenex donates a bottle of its children's multivitamins to a child in need with every purchase. That's a big deal because their usual promo code that I do is only 15% off. So now is the time to check it out. 
I've had so many testimonials from listeners who have experienced real noticeable health benefits from Prevenex products, and that makes me so happy. I really encourage you to check out these products and do it for that 20% off now. Go to Prevenex.com, use the code ANOTHER20 until Thursday, and then the regular Black Friday coupon through Sunday, November 28th to get 20% off your entire order. That's Prevenex.com. Keep those testimonials coming. I want to hear when you've had excellent benefits. All right. And I recommend the protein powder, the Joint Health Plus, the multivitamin. My kids also take the kids' Supervites. So many great products over there. Check it all out. Prevenex.com. Use the code ANOTHER20 for 20% off your order through next Thursday. And that's Thanksgiving. Next Thursday is Thanksgiving. Uh, All right, friends, back to the show. Let's talk about that a little bit because I think that, you know, a lot of people use running as like an escape, right? Like from the hard things in life. But like you can't always do that. That's just like not sustainable. So can you talk about like how you handled that, like how you, like now what, right? And like you knew that like trying to compete at the highest level was not sustainable for your life. So what did those next few months look like? And when did you decide, I'm just going to give New York like a shot? Like I'm just going to train and raise money for addiction awareness and, you know, like make it about something different than what I've always trained for? How did you walk through those months? Yeah. Um, I, the, the, the other part of finding Zach was it really triggered my eating disorder. Cause I, my eating disorder comes from wanting to control things. So, and also not wanting to feel the emotions that needed to be felt. I'd rather feel hungry. Like I, that's a feeling that I know and I'm comfortable with that. So it's a really hard thing when the, 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 what made me quote unquote cure my eating disorder before was running mm. because I, that in 2012, when I just missed the Olympic team, my brain went and I, so during, the, during that period of time of trying to make the Olympic team appealing, 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 my eating disorder kicked back up and then I ended up breaking my ankle and I went, you know what? You have a shot at being good at this. You need to get this eating thing under control. So then flash forward to finding Zachary and it triggering the eating disorder again This time, though, I don't care about running enough Mm -hmm. to use running as a tool to cure the eating. So I did try, like, he passed at the end of April. We tried to do a race in June in Portland. I got through 4K of of the 10K there, and I just was, like, crying in the race. Mm -hmm. Hadn't eaten anything really in days. I'm going, what the F are you doing? And I just stepped off the the track ugly crying and like, people were like it's okay you'll have another shot and I was like you have no idea what I'm crying about at all um I'll say like Allie Kiefer was there mm. and she was so kind to me because she like she finished the race but she wasn't happy with the race her mom was there and she's like let's just go get food and beer and the one thing with my eating disorder is I will socially eat mm-hmm. if you put it in front of me and we're out in public. And especially if I have a beer or two, I'll pick up the food. So I know that's a hack that I do. So, but if she hadn't been there, I don't know what I would have done. I would have just gone back to my Airbnb and just ugly cried until my flight at 4 a.m. Like, um, but yeah, that was when I really realized, forget this. I went and did the New York mini just as a a reason, a distraction. Like I, again, I'm very honest. So I let the race know, like, I'm not going to be 32 minute 10 K Lanny. Like I'm going to try to run quick, but who knows? And I have this leg thing from left. That's why we did the hip surgery is it's been called a dystonia, but I don't, I don't believe that it is, but when I'm really emotionally distraught, it really kicks up and doesn't, my leg just doesn't work. The nerves get all funny. So I anticipated that was what was going to happen in the race. So, and it did. So I was like, you know what, if I break 35 minutes, that is a win today. And that was kind of the first step towards going, okay, we're not, you're not training enough to race these girls. You don't really want to race these girls. It's been hell trying to get fit enough to race these girls. 
you're just gonna move your body and like run when you want to don't if you don't I think it was in July or August that my it must be yeah, well, August my agent said that I was offered a spot in the New York City Marathon and I was like you are crazy <laughs> like, I am I even before all this happened this spring I did not think my body wanted to run a marathon ever again hell no um <laughs> And he's like, well, just keep your name on the list and, you know, you can decide week to week to week. So, and that's all I did. I spent um, most of July running, I think I'd run three or four times a week, just jumping in with other people. Um, I do CrossFit or rollerblade or um, hit workouts, yoga. Like I was just doing whatever, like whatever my girlfriends are doing, I jump in. Whatever my running friends are doing, I jump in. Um, Edna Kiplagat was really great during that time because she, um, I talked to her and Grace when we were at the New York Mini because they were curious and I explained what had happened with Zach. Mm -hmm. And then after that, they was just started texting and being like, hey, like if you want to meet for this run, come run. And I would always say yes. It's kind of like the the social eating. If you invite me to run, I'll go. Yeah. Unless I have like a major scheduling conflict, I'll go. So they would just like text me and invite me to run. I get dropped 90% of the time, but at least I would try. (laughs) Um, And same with uh, Carmen Graves and her husband down here in Denver. Carmen's a steepler. She ran at the uh, U.S. trials. Same thing. They would just be like, we're going to do this. Like Carmen's doing this speed track session, like want to come. And she's running like 300s faster than I can run a 200. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Like I would just go and show up and just do really stupid things in the sense of my bot, like, not caring, I guess, mm-hmm. if it caught, if I pulled a hamstring or get it, you know, I didn't care. But did it feel good? Like, did you feel like a release? It was just fun. It was a, it was the first time running had been fun in since 2012, really. It was the first time, like, I was just like, I don't care if I go on this trail run and trip and smack my face and roll down the hill. Like, what, what am I worried about? I'm not training for anything important. And that was July, August, and September. Um, then at the end of September, unfortunately, so I had a a friend that I really relied on, uh, a male friend that I relied on during the, get the worst of the Zach stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, became close. And then at the end of September, I learned that he was becoming close with other women as well. And so that was really heartbreaking. Um, and so, yeah, it just kind of like, I was like, really? Like what the, okay, universe, just stop. Like at some, just leave me alone just stop so um that was like really devastating but then that was when I was like you know what like you're used to these lumps and bumps and this was just another wave that crashed on you so just keep doing what you're doing and so I just kept training started running with Carmen more and more running with Edna more and more and then yeah we were before I knew it we were three weeks out from New York and I was like oh gosh and I'd already reached out to the Release Recovery Foundation I'd already reached out to Zach Clark um early in September. So I was like, well, now I've already told them I'm running for them. Now, like, just because I'm heartbroken again, doesn't mean I can't run for them. I, I did when I found out about dude being a very basic dude for, <laughs> for that. Um, when I found out about it, I did, I ended up not running for like another couple weeks because my, that really, the eating thing really got bad at that point. And I got down to like maybe 95 pounds. It just wow. went really bad. Um, and I was like, oh, fuck. I was just like, damn it, Landy, like you don't let this person be the reason why you don't go and run for good and run for a better, bigger purpose. So I kept the carrot of running for the foundation as a reason to like put some food in my body, get back out there and jog a bit. Um, I had about at that point, I had about four weeks before the marathon. So I was like, every week you're just going to do some K repeats. And then the next week you're going to add two more. And the next week you'll add two more. And then the final week, you'll do, you'll cut back down and only do three, and then you're tapered, and then you're, that's that's it. That's your marathon build. Let's go. How many did so you did, do, did, like, max out at? I did four, six, eight, three. Okay. That was my build. That yep. was my build. I did four by a K with a minute rest. Then I did six by a K with two minutes rest, but faster. And then I did eight by a K back to the minute rest, still faster than the first four, but slower than the six. Those were the only speed then, sessions you did. Those are the only speed sessions I did um, leading into 
uh, New York. <laughs> and then were you doing so, your long runs with Edna? Who were you, were you doing those yeah. long runs with? So funny story. I show up for a run with Edna. I text her on a Tuesday night and I, I texted her and I was like, Hey, do you, are you running tomorrow? Do you want company? She was, yeah, I'm running, um, tomorrow morning. I have to run before my daughter goes to school. So we have to start at six. And I'm like, Oh, fuck it. <laughs> it's kind of getting down from coming up from Denver. And so I'm like, yeah, sure. And like typically on Wednesdays, like I've trained with her before in 2020. I was like, oh, like we'll probably do like 10 to 12 miles, which is still a stupid thing to do because I hadn't run for four days, uh-huh. which is why I texted her to have the motivation to do it. And uh, I show up and she's going 33K. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, and my dumbass goes, sure, I'll try as best I How can many and miles see what is happens. 33K? Like 21 or 22 okay. miles, I think. Okay. No, less than that. 18, 19 miles is about 30K. Okay. Yeah, so 21 miles. 21 okay. miles around there. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, bet. Like, again, I'm just doing stupid things. <laughs> well, and she had so already I, ran Boston. No, this is her training for Boston. Oh, this, this was before was in, Boston. Okay. Yeah, so this is before Boston. Um, so I go and I run, and she's running quick. And so I'm, I stay with her till about... 13 miles like she's dropping me but I'm like you know she'll like I'll like on the downhills I'll like surge uh-huh. she'll like catch I'm just like hanging on and then we get to like this road and I'm like isn't that the way back to the car and she goes that's when she's like no 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 I like she's still at 11k to go <laughs> that way and I was like my legs were done and I was like how far is it to go back to the car that way she goes oh 9k oh and gosh I'm going, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go this way and I'll meet you at the car. And we have to be done by like eight so she can be home for her daughter to go to school at 8.15. And I have to like walk, jog, crawl for the <laughs> next 9K. And my legs were done. They were hooked. And I get back literally as she's finishing running up. And, and I was like, I need to... Yeah, I was like, oh my gosh, Lanny. Um, so there was that long run. And then uh, other than that, I ran most of my long runs with Carmen and her husband, um, but they they were building, so they would do like ten miles and they do twelve miles. Um, I did get up. I did like a, a one twenty five k, another thirty k, and then another twenty five k. But my leg was so bad on those runs, I'd have to stop and walk all the time. Um, so when it came to time to run the marathon, I was like, I have no. I haven't gotten through a single long run where I haven't had to stop and like fix my hip or my whatever goes wrong, wrong with this nerve thing. I was like, whatever, just line up. And if the leg screws off, just run with your credit card and stop and grab a beer on the way. Like, I don't know. Um, so yeah, like that was my mindset going on the start line and was just, you're doing this for this release recovery foundation. You're doing this for Zach and your dad and everyone else who has kind of lost their, their way or lost their battle. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It can just be whatever it is. And that was very much how running was all spring and summer and fall. So I was like, just it doesn't just don't go for perfection. Just go for finishing. Isn't that wild though? I mean, that was like four minutes off your PR, is wasn't it? Yeah, it was a minute faster than I ran New York five years ago. Because <laughs> that was my last marathon was New York 2016. Wow. And so yeah, I was stunned. It, it felt easy mm. until it didn't the last two miles really hurt because my body was like you I, you did not train for this yeah that last two miles very much felt like that long run with Edna I uh-huh. was <laughs> just like what did you do why did you do this um did you know though so, that you were gonna run like a pretty decent time yeah like my goal was once I like realized it was going okay I was like can you get under 235 let's let's try that and um that last two miles, like I'd already told myself on the start line the whole time was if I want to, I can walk. Mm. And so when everything started cramping at that last two miles, I was like, you, you can walk. But that's where I really thought of my dad and Zach. And I had a friend commit suicide after the Olympics. And there's so many people that are just struggling out there that I was like, just because you can walk doesn't mean you have to, you can still try to run, Mm -hmm. like keep trying to run. If you fall over, then walk. But just because you've given yourself the excuse that you can walk doesn't mean you have to keep trying to run it was kind of my last two miles it was just you've run this far you don't if you really really can't run walk 
but right now you can still run. So run. And that was what got me over the finish line for the last two miles. Um, how much did you stay with the pack? Not at all. You the didn't even start went, with them? I, no, because I didn't want to get sucked into running outside of myself. Mm-hmm. And then if my leg messed up at 5K, that's a long way to go. Um, and I, I don't think I would change that. I think if I'd gone with them, I might have just been, they, there was a lot of weird surging and stuff mm-hmm. that went on with that race. It would have given more notoriety to the hat that I was wearing with the release recovery. Like they would have gotten more TV time. Yeah. But no, I think um, I think how I just how I went off the start was the perfect way. And then I just could pick girls off as they were going. The first 5K, I was just high fiving and waving at people. And I didn't even like run through to grab my water bottle. I just kind of like skipped through and grabbed it. <laughs> and then by by 10K, I was like, I could see some girls had fallen off the pack. And I was like, oh. Do you, want to, do you want to try and catch them? I'm like you in this stop, race. Like, yeah, I was like, you have to stop dancing. Like, <laughs> go, go get them. And so, yeah, then like the competitive juices started flowing. And I haven't had that in forever in a race. So it was just kind of fun. And I don't know, like like I said, it felt easy. And I, I don't mean that to be cocky that mm-hmm. like I hardly trained and look at how good I am. I think it was that. I had, I've been in counseling since finding Zach. I've done counseling before, but this time was like, really just let's figure out why I keep encountering these bad situations and why my body keeps holding on to all this trauma. And I think also the big part of it was like, why do I hate running so much now? Like, why has it become the worst part of my day? And working through all that, I think this is the the lightest I ever ran in a marathon Mm. or in any race. It was just everything felt easy because I wasn't fighting to do anything outside of just run and get to the next water station, catch the next girl. If you don't catch her, fine, but like try. I was, so I think it was the lightest and the easiest I've ever had a, a race experience be. You know, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people talk about like when you race pressure free, sometimes those are your best races. And when you're running at the level you run, you know, this year aside, like there has, there is pressure, like there's pressure. Yeah, you're trying to make no Olympic thing is pressure free running. Yeah. Like you're trying to make Olympic teams like there. That's, it's just part of it. It's your job. It's a big deal. Um, but do you think that, well, you needed that healing, like you needed to, yeah. you needed that to happen. Do you feel like that race provided healing in some way? Definitely. I think I, I said right after the race that I've just closed the circle. New York 2016 was when from that race on, like life had already been a bit difficult. Let's be honest, like selling plasma by groceries isn't ideal. Right. Like life, had, life I'd already had like, you know, pretty bad, car, bad cards dealt to me previous to that race in 2016. But then after New York 2016 is when everything in my life just fell apart. Everybody was, everyone was dying or and I was sick and it was just awful. Injuries, all of it. And so then by running New York, my, I was like, you know, that better close Pandora's box. Like, I hope that closes the circle and the next five years, 10 years, 15 years can be things getting easier. I don't expect them to ever be easy. I don't think that will ever be my, my story, <laughs> but at least go get, let things be easier. Like let this be the final thing that closes that chapter and I can move on to other things and let, let running be whatever it is and let life just kind of go up. I'm ready for it to go. An upswing would be really nice. We started the upswing with New York. Um, how did you pick the recovery program? Tell us about the specific one that you ran for? Yeah, so I knew, like I said, at the start of September, I knew I wasn't going to be like, well, I didn't think I was going to be a 232 girl. Like I was like, you know what? The pressure to just run this marathon as like a comeback race is going to kill me. I can't do that. Is there another way I can get myself to that start line? And so I talked to my agent and was honest with the race directors, which I always think is important to do. And just like, I need another reason to run is there a charity that you guys are, you know, have as part of the race or that you've heard of that's New York based that deals with addiction and um, recovery, mental health, et cetera. And just within a day, I had Zach Clark 
calling me. And Zach oh, is a yeah. recovering addict. Is he the bachelor he, guy? Yeah, he's the bachelor guy. I remember um, him. Yeah. Yeah. So he won Bachelorette or something. Yeah, I don't he really was, watch the yeah, shows. He so. was um, Tasha's. Yeah. Him yeah. And together. So they're and Tasha together. Yeah. Yeah. They're together. Um, so they called me and they, or he called me and was like, yeah, like this would be great. We could set you up with your own fundraising campaign like most other people are doing the fundraising and that's how they earn their bib but you already have your bib um and then unfortunately it was that week later that I found out about dude McGee being basic so and then I got my ankle got kind of my calf got kind of messed up and then I got bronchitis so then I had three or four weeks of just like my body just going like okay you really are going to be walking this marathon like you're heartbroken and really just not in a good spot and so I felt bad because I kind of fell off with them like I said I'd do it and so then I messaged and I was like hey like life just kind of hit me with another wave I still want to run for your foundation can we just can I just direct people towards a general fundraiser like I don't want to have people donating to me or in my name I want them to go straight the funds go straight to you and the attention goes straight to you I'm not doing this for attention on Lanny and they were completely receptive to that I went and did the, like, met them for their pre-run, pre-race shakeout. That's when I got, they got me the hat. And, uh, yeah, and then I, it was really nice to be able to run with a purpose greater than just Lanny's out here trying to run a fast marathon. Um, and, yeah, like, I, we, the goal was over $400,000, and that's what we we were able to raise. And they did a real, like, Zach ran London Marathon. I think he ran Boston as oh, well. Oh, wow. Like, he was out there really ch- drawing attention to it. Um, and so I was just happy to be able to wear the hat and kind of let people know through my social media that there's these foundations out there that can save people going through the trauma that Zach's family that I went through, my, my family with my dad, like there's help out there and people don't realize how expensive that help is. Oh, yeah. And so having these fund- having a foundation like release recovery where they provide the funds to people that want to better their lives and kick their addictions is phenomenal because there's just there's not enough attention drawn to it do you have a complicated relationship with alcohol because of the addictions in your family and your and Zach yeah I like everyone knows I love my beer and there's probably times where I've had too many one too many but um I, I always try to, um, I always check in. I'll always like be like, you know, let's just take a week or two off of drinking. Mm-hmm. And it's not like a, I can't wait for two weeks to be over. I need that beer. It's like the two weeks will go by and I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, you're, you're good. And then if I want to have a beer, I'll have a beer. And when I'm seriously training, my rule is usually Monday to Thursdays, you no alcohol. And then between Thursday and Sunday, I can pick two of the days to have drinks Oh, I like so that. you really only end up drinking you really only end up drinking twice a week but if you just do weekends there's always something on a Thursday that's I what know. I found and like there's always like or on a Sunday there's like football like yeah so I yeah so when I'm in more tr- like proper training mode mm-hmm. I'll be like two days between Thursday and Sunday you can have some beers but Monday through Thursday you can't um right now I'm kind of just if I want to have a beer I have a beer if I don't I don't Um, But yeah, I kind of always check in with myself and I have a good group of friends and I I feel like they would tell me if they're like, you're, you're boozing a bit too much these days and they they would step in. But no, it's something that I, I don't know why I have that ability versus my dad Mm -hmm. and other people in my family didn't. Um, But also opioids are much harsher and way harder to kick than my love of beer, I guess. Hey friends, a quick break here. I am taking on a few coaching clients right now. I cap out my list at 10 athletes and I have room for three more people. And right now, actually, if you also sign up for a nutrition course with Anna Turner, who is the registered dietitian I refer all of my runners to, uh, we're both offering 20% off. So Send me an email, lindsay at sandyboyproductions.com to learn more. And then also, if you are interested in a training plan, I have 18-week marathon training plans that have a pretty healthy base building 
section in the training plan, like a good four weeks where you're just mostly base building. And I have a beginner, an intermediate, and an advanced training plan. And those are pre-designed. They have a pace chart in them, as well as pre and post run stretching and strength routines I recommend and a weekly strength routine. There's a video in there where we have the exercises on the video and then I'm talking you through the exercises and the audio of that as well. Um, so whatever pace you're trying to hit, like if you're trying to run a sub four hour marathon or something, you can just reference the pace chart to see what you should be targeting tempo runs and intervals at and all that good stuff. And uh, there's a key that has all the terminology in there. It's really beautifully designed by my friend Meredith. Um, so if you go to lindsayhine.com and just check out the shop, you can find those training plans. There are also 14 week half marathon training plans. There's a beginner, a beginner intermediate, an intermediate and an advanced plan. And those are all 14 weeks, same deal. They have pace charts and everything as well. So if you don't really feel like investing fully in a coach and doing all that, I think these training plans are really, really well designed. And the only thing I would say about it is just listen to your body. And if there's a week where you feel like you need to cut back a little bit or take a rest, like you don't have to stay married to the plan. You can adjust and move things around. So I'm always here to answer your questions in that regard. I can also write you a custom training plan as well. I love doing those and um, had several people qualify for Boston this fall using my plan. So that was super exciting. Uh, again, that shop for the training plans are at lindsayhine.com and you can always email me lindsay at sandyboyproductions.com to learn more about custom plans and coaching from me. Cool. All right. Enjoy the rest of my conversation with Lanny. What do you think is, is next? Do you, are you just going to like chill through the holidays or what do you, what's on your mind? Yeah, I'm just going to run when I want. Don't, and I don't. Um, I nanny twice a week. Okay. I dog sit. I write for a blog. I work for my law firm. Like every, I'm just, you're very busy. Keep doing That's it. a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But it all kind of complements itself. Like when the kid naps, I can write the blog. And so it's just one if kid. I might, yeah. Yeah. And if I have my dog having another dog here, I have to walk my dog anyways. And then they play, they distract each other. Like pretty much all of it complements what I'm already doing. Mm. Um, it's just extra money. Because I don't have a sponsorship anymore. Yeah, you were with Under Armour, right? I was with Under Armour, um, and I am grateful that they stuck with me through all my illness and injuries. Um, it just everyone kept leaving the company. There were so many shifts, and I got mm -hmm. passed around to different reps, and there were just breakdowns in communication. Um, and so we were talking about renewal, and then Zach died, and I was like, I don't care. Mm. I was like, I. I don't care. I was like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I don't want to be beholden to you to perform at a certain level or do certain things. I don't want to have to try and explain to you why I'm withdrawing from the trials. And I just, I didn't care. And my agent was like, well, we can circle back with them. And I was like, I can make money other ways. And if eventually a company wants to pick me up or ideally throw money at a recovery foundation, just put the money there and I'll be fine yeah. I've always been fine I've rubbed two pennies together my entire life I'll make ends meet I just I don't agree with how the, sh the industry works with sponsorships that you can have two very talented athletes be paid astronomically different sums and no it's just I I loved being able to line up and wear what I wanted to wear in New York I wore my Wonder Woman That's shorts awesome. I wore some I love that some fast shoes and I just I loved it, and I haven't gotten to do that since 2012 because I've been with a, with Saucony or Asics yeah. or Under Armour, and they pay. They don't, <clears throat> especially being Canadian, they don't pay very well. But then they expect you to act like you're Usain Bolt and getting you know millions of dollars. Yeah. So it's like you're not even paying me enough to cover my monthly rent. So no, would That's you live insane. off of ten thousand dollars a year? No. Okay, then stop asking for you know million dollar posts for right. $10,000. <laughs> like, um, that's insane. I mean, the discre the difference between what different athletes get paid by companies is just crazy. Yeah. I would love to make a like athletes union. And so we could start getting some collective bargaining going on. But the problem is, is I know like 
like with ASICs, I was making 10 grand, I think, for the year. No travel bonuses. I would get a thousand, a thousand, a thousand bucks if I won nationals. Like it was just frustrating. Um, but I was getting paid versus other runners weren't. So Who like were you that's sponsored the problem. by in 2016 when you went to the Olympics? ASICs. And you were getting paid $10,000 a year? Yeah, Canadian. And I was living in the U.S. So that's like basically half. <laughs> that's insane. Yeah. Um, but there was athletes who were not paid at all who were at the Olympics. And there was athletes who, but the more, the more support you have, the better athlete you can become, right? right? Like you can, you can get treatment, you can travel, you can go to the better races, et cetera, et cetera. But until we as runners realize our value that we're not a commodity or a luxury item and start to all of our contracts have NDAs. Like we're not allowed even like to line up in New York. We're all paid different amounts. Some mm-hmm. of us aren't paid at all. Mm-hmm. You're not allowed to talk about it mm-hmm. because it's part of the, the rules. But if we were to accidentally just start talking about it, like when <laughs> I studied sports, when I studied sports law at Michigan state, you can look up the contracts for football players and NHL players. Like, you can look and like their private endorsement deals fine. You might not know what Gatorade's paying them, but you can look up the Denver Broncos and see what their, you know, the, one of their defensive men is being paid. Like it's public. You can find it. You can't look up what no. Molly Seidel is being paid or me or when Flan- like Flanagan when she was, well, she's still with Nike, I guess. I don't really know how that works, but yeah. I have no idea what these, these people are being paid. So that's so interesting when I'm captain of the world. Yeah. You'll take sure everything's take on that. Um, (laughs) Okay. So what is something professionally or personally that you would like to do that you haven't done yet? Um, I someday I'd like to run Berlin marathon, whether fast or slow. I don't really care. I just want to run it. Um, otherwise I just, I want to travel because I feel like the last five years were just everything was built around getting my body healthy. Mm-hmm. So like I turned down awesome trips with family or friends and cause I was like, no, like I have to do my rehab or I have to go to Phoenix and see this person. And so I'm just kind of like, you know what? I don't care to put all my energy into fixing my body. So yeah, I just want to travel. So I might do that in the spring. And if I find a little fun, like, there's so many fun races. Like there's like trail races in Costa Rica you can do. Like, yeah. If I find a place that I want to go and I want to run and then there, great. That's kind of where I'm at with it. Yeah. It sounds very pressure free. Yeah. Um, what is the best, most recent book you've read? The Body Keeps Score. Oh. <clears throat> it's about trauma. Okay. Trauma in the body. I actually have it right here. Who's that by? Whoopsies. Um, Bessel van der Kolk. <laughs> okay, I've heard of it. Okay. So it talks about childhood trauma, war veterans, et cetera, et cetera. People that are, you know, had a traumatic experience like me finding Zach about how your brain, it changes your brain and it changes how your body works and it changes how you receive people and things in your life. Um, I actually had read it years ago, but I was still, my brain was still too foggy from being so sick. And so I reread it this summer and I was just like, Oh my goodness. I was wow. like, like the whole thing is just, I've all I've done is highlight in it and play with it. Cause, um, yeah, it's such a, it was a really good book. I also just started reading this one. I do fun reading as well. Like, yeah. I'll read, like reread, I'll reread Harry Potter and stuff. Uh-huh. Um, but this one is, I thought it was just me, but it isn't making the journey from what will people think to I'm enough. And okay. it's about shame. Okay. And actually there's a, at the start that I really liked where is it oh I dog eared it is this it courage is a heart word the root of the word courage is core the Latin word for heart in one of its earliest forms the word courage meant to speak one's mind by telling one telling all one's heart mm. I just really liked that to speak one's mind by telling all one's heart was actually what courage was meant to mean like and then now it's changed is to like heroic and bravery but actually, you are heroic and brave if you're going to speak all that's in your heart. All of it. Yeah. Um, and then the other part was the prerequisite for empathy is compassion. We can only respond empathetically if we are willing to hear someone's pain. 
We sometimes think of compassion as a saint-like virtue. It's not. In fact, compassion is possible for anyone who can accept the struggle that makes us human, our fears, imperfections, losses, and shame. Hmm. That's so, good. Yeah. This one I just started. It's like one of those books where you're underlining everything. Yeah. It's just like there's so many quotes in it where it's just like, and how she describes like shame is such a hard thing to define. And so she's found in her study, the best thing to do is just have people talk about a moment they felt shameful Mm. or they felt ashamed because the actual definition of shame is so, it gets tied into embarrassment, but it's not embarrassment. It's something different. And so I'm curious to see where, where this goes. Cause I, like I said, I'm just, I'm new into it. So yeah, I'm reading, um, Oh, I think it's called Dawn Dusk Night. Oh, I'm going to forget it. Anyway, it's Anne Lamott and it's, I'm underlining so much in it. It's, it's so good. And it's on courage as well. Yeah. Revival no, so and courage. Nice. Yeah. They're just, I forget who gave this to me, but it was, I was like, you know what? Yeah, I started reading it, um, right after, Dude McGee was a loser. So get out of here, Dude McGee. We don't like you. Dude McGee. No, we're not. We're not fans anymore. Um, What's your last message to leave with the audience? Um, Keep treading water. Mm. That's been that was my mantra for the race for New York. And it's not some people might think it's bleak, but Mm. I've learned at least this summer that every time I try to swim for shore, there's either a person there who's promising to help like this, this man who then, as soon as I thought he was helping me to shore, he threw, throws a brick at me and it makes me sink under the water again. I'm content with the shoreline being there. Someday I will swim for it. Mm. I'm happy. I'm good at treading water. I can The waves can crash down and I can keep treading water. Tread water until you're certain you can swim to shore by yourself. Don't look for someone to help you to shore. But if you stay treading water, you learn to trust yourself. You'll get real, you get strong and you the shore is there. Keep shore in sight. Cause I think what happened with Zach and my dad and so many others is they let the waves wash them away further and further. And they, they're trying to tread water, but they're, they've lost sight of shore. So just stay treading water on the edge of shore. And when you're ready, swim, swim for it. But if you're not ready or if somebody promises to help you trust yourself that you you've got this and you can tread water better than anybody else. Wow. That's beautiful. How'd you come up with that? <laughs> Um, I was actually my girlfriend that's here that's going to watch my dog for me because I'm going to Mexico to get my teeth fixed. Um, <laughs> super che- it's super cheap down there. Um, that's why you're going. Her. Yeah. I'm taking some of the money that I got for New York and I haven't had, because I was so sick. Like my teeth have been crumbling out of my mouth since law school. Like I haven't been able to chew on both sides of my mouth for years. And I was like, you know what? I'm ready to like not hide my smile when I talk to people. Aww. So um yeah, so I was with my friend Zulius, and I don't remember what we were talking about. I think we were talking about hope, and I said that hope is awful. I don't want to have hope because with <clears throat> with hope, there's a you take a risk that's you know there's a, there's a payout at the end that mm-hmm. could be good. And for me, it's really hard to believe good's going to come because it just constantly hasn't been good. And so I was like, I don't want the hope of sure. I want to just stay where I'm at and tread water. And then we like just through us talking, that's where I was like, and she was like, well, like she was trying to like keep it very like light and happy. And I'm like, I'm not being unhappy and I'm not, it's not that I'm not being light about it. I actually, this, as soon as I adopted this mindset, everything got better Mm because I stopped like being jealous of the people that could make it to shore. And I stopped Mm -hmm. fighting to make it to shore. And I stopped trusting people like that man who I thought would help me to shore. If I'm going to get to shore, it will be on my own. And I'm happy treading water. Like, I know I'm good at it. And I, they're keeping the shoreline in sight means I still do have hope. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to be cautious about how I approach it going forward. I love that. That's so good. Um, are you going to Mexico today? Yeah, I'm going to fly to Arizona <laughs> and then drive to Mexico. I was there last week and then they fixed this side of my mouth. I have, I'm uh- going to get an implant. But it was only like twenty two hundred bucks to fix my entire mouth. And you just come home and now you're going back. Yeah. We were going to try and do it all in one trip, but I had to be back. Like I needed to come back to Nanny on Monday and Tuesday. Uh And I had my dog with me last time and I'm going to leave her this time. And then that way I can um, just nip down there, get it done, 
spend the weekend in Phoenix with my friends. And nice. So back. you'll just be in Mexico for the day and then you'll pop back over to Phoenix. Um, I'll stay the night cause I'll do, they'll do Thursday and Friday okay. cause I'll prep the implant and then they'll do the implant the next day. Okay. And then I'll spend Friday night and Saturday night in Phoenix and then fly on Sunday. And then we're doing Friendsgiving here. So I have to cook a nice. turkey on Sunday. Nice. I love it. Cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and thanks for coming on the show. No, thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, have fun in Mexico. <laughs> not that that's so fun. Have fun in Phoenix. I know Mexico yeah, is like, I'll, not fun. I'll definitely have, have a good time in Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Thanks, Lanny, for coming on the show. Best of luck with what's next for you. Uh, friends, you can find Lanny on Instagram. She is Lanny Marchant over there. You can find me on Instagram. I'm Lindsay Hine 626 I would love to connect with you. Check out the other podcasts in the Sandy Boy Network, sandyboyproductions.com. And we also have an Instagram for Sandy Boy, Sandy Boy Productions. I host a parenting podcast. Well, more so a podcast for parents. I'm no parenting expert. Um, it's called Why Is Everyone Yelling? You should check it out. I think you might like it. And don't forget that Prevenex sale that I, they've got going on right now. It is for 20% off rather than 15. So now is the time to check it out. If you've been interested in their supplements or protein powder, go to Prevenex.com and use the code ANOTHER20 for 20% off your order. All right, cool. You guys have a great weekend. And as always, I'll see you next Friday.